Hello and welcome everyone today. Uh, I am Matthew Quint, the director of the Center on Global Brand Leadership at Columbia Business School. Really happy to have you here today at the Brand Center. Our mission is to create, gather, and share knowledge on what it takes to build a strong brand. And we look forward to today's webinar as an interesting discussion on exactly that point. So welcome to Dream, Do, Dare, Using Brand Mission to Drive Market Opportunity. I'm really excited about the session today. You know, the interconnectivity of our digital world has changed the relationship between brands and their stakeholders, making the clarity and commitment to a brand's mission more impactful than ever before. Wanted to go through a couple of logistics uh, before we get started with the session. Uh, we are recording the session, so we will plan to share a link with everyone once it has been publicly posted. Also, to ask questions, please try to use the Q&A feature in the center at the bottom of your Zoom client. Uh, that's the best way for us to be able to keep track of questions. The chat is also open. If you have a comment uh, to the panelists and myself, uh, please use that. Uh, but please try to ask your questions using the Q&A feature. This makes it easier to sort through them. So without further ado, I want to thank in particular, uh, JP Kulwein, uh, who is a friend of the Brand Center and adjunct faculty member at the, of the marketing department at Columbia Business School, a principal at Uber Brands Consulting. And his latest book is called Brand Elevation, Lessons in Uber Branding. And that is the inspiration for today's panel, which will feature Ben and Jerry's, Next Door, TerraCycle, Zulf Consulting. So without further ado, JP, why don't you come on stage? I'm right here well, on the virtual stage. So hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for the intro, Matt. Thanks for having us all here. So Kulwein Great. is the name. I'm an adjunct here at Columbia. I teach a course on premium brand strategy. And in my previous life, um, I worked at Procter & Gamble for longer than I want to admit. And today we're going to talk about brand elevation, how to make a brand peerless and priceless. And the origins of that really hark back to that time at Procter & Gamble and more specifically to the economic crisis because I was director of brand strategy at P&G at that time. And one of the things that fascinated us was that, um, or puzzled us, I should say, to a large extent, was that little niche brands that we were sure would go under during an economic crisis where people were tied on money, we're actually flourishing. I'm talking about the Toms of Maine toothpaste or the Ben and Jerry's ice cream that we have actually on the panel today. So we'll be able to talk about that. Um, those were premium brands. We considered them niche and we were fascinated that they were doing very well. In fact, they were doing better in many cases than the mainstay leading brands um, and they were doing better than the brands that we thought should be growing during an economic crisis, which are the discount kind of store brands, et cetera, et cetera. From there started truly a fascination with what drives these premium brands. How are they able to kind of set themselves above and beyond the fray uh, and able to be successful in many instances with significant premium pricing over the average. So we started with typical PNG fashion with a cross-functional team across R&D and finance, uh, uh, design, you name it, marketing, of course, and we really studied them in detail um, and extracted some interesting principle, but Wolfgang and I, Wolfgang is also on this panel, my co-author on uh, the two books we've written on the subject, um, we really got uh, almost obsessed with that in a good way, in a good way and really dove into what creates these uh, brands, these elevated brands. We call them new prestige, a new kind prestige, or better, Uber brands, not just to annoy everyone with the pronunciation of Uber, like in Kühlwein and so on, or in Zwölf, but because Uber in German is one of those unique words, just like Schadenfreude, uh, and it means above and beyond. And that's what we felt many of these brands do. They go above and beyond. 
They're not a home exercise machine or a smartphone. They are a Peloton and an iPhone. And to people who own them, they mean a lot more than you know, the functional material things that they are. In fact, funnily, in many of our Zoom meetings that we're now having, I see just a little bit of Peloton being squeezed into the picture by people because to them, it expresses something about themselves, their attitude, their fitness, their belonging to a social, social, economic class, how they take care of their body, and so on and so on. They accumulate meaning. So as I said, we're fairly obsessive about that, Wolf and I. Wolf, can I welcome you quickly to this panel? Hello. Yeah, I've been there and, all along. And I think we've uh, invited, as I said, uh, quite a few people who can talk very intelligently and insightfully about elevating brands. And that is, I'll start with Deborah Gutz, who is the head of brand marketing at Nextdoor. Um, Nextdoor being an online neighborhood community where members do not behind, hide behind an avatar um, or uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 make anonymous statements, but rather very consciously join a community. We call this daring, and you'll know a lot about that once we discuss it. This is a daring way of doing it. Hello, Deborah. Maybe we can see you there as well, just for a little bit, so it's not so anonymous. JP, then, great to see you. And I love hearing, yes, real people, real neighborhoods. That's what we're about. There we go. Okay, I got it. Um, we also have Dave here. I already mentioned Ben and Jerry's. Dave is the Global Social Mission Officer at Ben and Jerry's. Interesting title, interesting function within an ice cream company. Hello, Dave. Hey. Good to be here. And um, he pops up in our research and books all the time in our podcast. So I'm always worried about wearing Dave out, but he volunteered. Thank you so much for coming again on this panel today. It's really fascinating what they do when it comes to doing. So that's another element of our model. Doing is really important to have ideas that do. Actually, being the good teacher, hopefully, that I am, I want to project just for a second, this model. Um, everyone always likes a model. I think a visual and an alliteration uh, can do a lot to help you remember. We're talking about dream, do, and dare. And it's all based on the brand DNA. Dream, do, and dare. And it actually starts with dream, which uh, brings me back to our last panelist, as soon as I figure out how to stop sharing. Um, here we go. Um, to our last panelist, who is Tom Zaki. Hello, Tom. Very, very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I hope you don't mind, but I keep liking to call you the Jesus of waste <laughs> management. And actually, people will be in, insulted somewhat, I think, particularly at Terra Cycle, to talk about waste management. And we'll see that it really goes way beyond that. We love this case study of TerraCycling because, TerraCycle, sorry, because um, it is a category waste management that is not glamorous to say the least. It is business to business and it just shows, to a large extent at least, and it just shows that any business, any proposal, any brand and service can be elevated. And Tom, uh, we're gonna start out with him, is gonna talk about that dream part. Uh, if you've ever read Joseph Campbell or heard um, uh, some of the interesting interviews on PBS, you'll know that uh, uh, dreaming uh, and myth, the myth is a shared dream. And we think that TerraCycle is a great example of not only having a mission, but also translating it to a shared dream, which we call the myth. And that perfectly represents what I call this dream bubble earlier on. So hello again, uh, Tom, welcome to the show. Um, as I said, let's start with you. Um, it will strike people as strange to talk about waste management and dream. Mission, yes, but myth, not so much. Can you tell us a little bit about your personal background? And I think you'll tell us that there is an idea, hmm. an idea that's called um, doing away with the idea of waste itself, 
that came before the whole company. Is that right? Absolutely. And uh, just to, you know, to sort of give a point before, you know, uh, uh, that piece, I think in the unexpected areas, right, like waste management, there is actually a huge amount of opportunity. So I'd always encourage anyone listening to explore those areas that are always ignored. Um, you know, so for me, uh, my journey began, uh, uh, I was born in Budapest uh, in 83, and that's only, I'm oh, sorry, 82, and that's only relevant uh, because it was still communist at the time under the Iron Curtain. And in 86, Chernobyl happened, uh, and we were able to leave really more my parents, I was four at the time, as political refugees, you know, seeking asylum in Germany, then Holland, then Belgium, and finally Canada, where I got when I was uh, four. And then grew up in Canada and came down to college in New Jersey, which is where I'm uh, speaking to you from today. And I mentioned the story uh, uh, only because it was a story of leaving communism and ending up in you know uh, the heartland of capitalism. And for me, I fell in love with uh, with entrepreneurship. You know, and to be honest, like in high school, I you know started a company when I was fourteen. You know, web design things like that. But it was really for the selfish reasons. You know, uh, very egotistical reasons of fame and fortune, which uh, can come uh, uh, to you know in, in, in entrepreneurship. But I had a massive turning point, and this is really what uh, uh, brought to life sort of the genesis of TerraCycle was, I remember this very clearly in uh, uh, my first class at Princeton was Economics 101, you know, Introduction to Econ, and the professor gets up on stage, and mind you, this is the first class, first lecture, first experience, and she asks, what's the purpose of business? Which is, mind you, a very reasonable opening question to economics. And the answer she was looking for was profit to shareholders. That's the purpose. I mean... I get it. I'm, I'm a capitalist and I think profit is very important, but it took a lot of excitement away because, you know, you think about it, look at all the stakeholders who interact with the business, uh, the um, customers, the uh, uh, consumers, the uh, vendors, the employees. I mean, I don't think anyone cares about profit to shareholders except a select few people who actually have equity in that company. And to me, it created this sort of reframing opportunity. Like, what is the purpose of profit? Because it's not to be anti-profit, but isn't profit more an indicator of health? Right. If you're profitable, it's like being healthy. You're going to grow. You're going to flourish. You're going to be able to spread your mission. And if you're not profitable, it's like being sick. You will constrain and die. And, you know, in business, uh, that would be equal to going bankrupt one day. And uh, so this began the very beginning, even before we had the idea, it was how to put purpose first and to execute that purpose at a profit. And garbage just became the landing point because it's the, the topic that is most filled with anomalies. I'll just give you one example and then stop, which is you know, isn't it funny? We live in a very materialistic world today where we judge our status in no small part to how much stuff we have. But the garbage company is the only in, a garbage industry is the only industry in the world that can say it will legally own everything you possess one day with no exception. I mean, everything. And for how big that idea is, isn't it strange that it's one of the least innovative industries per dollar of revenue it enjoys? So you can imagine there's a lot to unpack there for an entrepreneurial point of view. Right. And and this and and you are a disciple. I mean, I don't call you the Jesus for nothing. I mean, you you at minimum you you're a disciple of spreading the word about eliminating the idea of waste itself. And it's truly embraced by a ton of different stakeholders that you have, right? Because it goes beyond just the employee and the customer. Let's say your customer are multiple, and your uh, your organization extends way beyond the paid people, right? Can you tell us a little bit the mission and how you enroll these people into the mission? Absolutely, um, I would say COVID has accentuated the look a little bit, um, but uh, <laughs> but nevertheless, um, you know, our mission uh, is not to manage waste but to solve for waste. Uh, you know, we say, you know, that's to eliminate the idea of waste. And we really lead with mission first, you know, for TerraCycle, you know, not to go into too much of the practical ways of how we do it, but it's moving companies from linear systems to recyclable, recycled content, reusable. And, you know, in that spirit, we work with just about every major brand in the world, you know, retailers now nationally across 20 countries and so on. But what is really powerful is that it's about how do you wield something with purpose and drive uh, a business value uh, uh, as you go, you know, whether it's a, a retailer driving more foot traffic, a brand driving more loyalty, but doing so while accomplishing the mission. And what that purpose has been incredibly powerful uh, in attracting uh, team members to join, you know, I mean, uh, as a waste management company, uh, you know, we get so many uh, unbelievable people who want to work with us. We're actually even majority female as an organization, which is very unusual in waste. Usually waste is not something people want to work at and let, and it's usually very male dominated. Um, we are able to sort of tap into different uh, uh, ecosystems and different ways to think because it's taking this idea of how do you eliminate waste, which everyone can rally around. 
but elevating it uh, 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 and then making it relevant for the different stakeholders, right, in their own ways. Because right now, many times, you know, we look at especially waste um, and solving for waste as managing a risk. But uh, nature doesn't look at waste that way. Nature looks at waste as a very useful input, you know, to, uh, uh, to the next ecosystem. In fact, probably anything we consume is the waste of some other organism, right? But in, in, in the human context, we don't have that philosophy. And the more we can embody that philosophy, the more it creates inspiration. And it actually, you know, if you walked into our offices, it would look more like walking into the offices of, say, MTV than it would look like walking into the offices of Waste Management, uh, Inc. And uh, uh, it brings a whole new point of view, you know, to innovation uh, and waste, which are usually two ideas that are typically more divorced, you know, than innovation in like high tech or fashion or cosmetics and so on. And what I find fascinating is you live this as an organization, but as we uh, observe with Uber brands, elevated brands in general, and it's funny to, like you say, to talk about waste and elevated brands, but that what it is, is um, your customers, which can be corporate customers, um, CPG companies um, mostly, are actually embracing parts of that meaning, parts of that mission, and making it their own, just like you make certain reflection on yourself when you use a Peloton, like I said earlier, or buy that uh, Birkin bag, um, and they integrate it into their own personality, proudly like taking on bits of it. I'm thinking of seeing all these pictures from various CPG companies collecting waste and plastics with you on beaches, et cetera, et cetera. You said at one point we had an interview before about it's as much about the mission as it is about the myth, it's like the steak and the sizzle. Can you talk a little bit about the yeah. sizzle and, and how you do that? Absolutely. Um, and I think it's that, you know, you have to have both, right? Uh, 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 and I think brands will understand, uh, you know, anyone who's in this call, the, the power of sizzle. Now you have to have authenticity, transparency, you have to have the substance. Um, but you also have to get people to become excited, to love, you know, to, to feel a part of the overall cause. Now, the way we try to do that with partners is we don't try to go into a partner and say, you know, please, you know, believe in our mission and make our mission your mission. Instead, we say we try to understand as much as we can about the, the partner. What is their mission? What are their business goals? Which are sometimes two very different questions. Like, what does the brand stand for? And what is the brand trying to achieve from a P&L point of view in the next, you know, 90 uh, days or a year? And then we try to really, you know, think about how can we bring to life and accentuate that overall purpose of the brand while injecting what our uh, uh, goals are. And then what tends to happen, which is incredibly exciting, is the brands make it their own. You know, they, and then we learn and, 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 and flourish much more uh, uh, because we uh, sort of come in and reinforce uh, 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 in their own slipstream. And I think this is very important as a lesson for anyone leading a social enterprise that is, you know, working with, say, brands or retailers, is many times the social enterprise is going to come in and only focus on their mission and then try to have that brand sort of meet, you know, that mission. And uh, that's okay, but you'll get a much, much higher success is if it's about coming to the brand and, and really not just understanding, but empathizing with what that brand is trying to achieve, what they're trying to stand for, again, two different things, and then showing them how they can accentuate that by reinforcing your own uh, mission. And I think right. this has been one of the greatest lessons for, uh, for me. And it also uh, creates um, this ability for what we do to, you know, create lots of colors and different ways it's manifested. And so we're able to do everything from, you know, cigarette recycling, where the partners could be, you know, tobacco companies, all the way to working, you know, uh, 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 on PPE, you know, collections to even ice cream and you name it, you know, all functioning simultaneously. Right. Right. Excellent. I know we could go on forever. I want to switch it around, though, a little bit. Um, Wolfgang, um, we're talking about guiding myth in the book. I think uh, Tom uh, shows us here how uh, these meta stories can work to kind of be a North Star, not only for the company, but key stakeholders, uh, 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 stakeholders here. Can you talk a little bit about the guiding myth and then maybe uh, turn it to Dave when we get into the doing from the myth making. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I think Tom talked perfectly about guiding myth and made it very clear how important it is to have a story um, to tell about the company and the mission overall. Uh, I think what, what often happens is that people do apply storytelling and marketing. I mean, that's, not, that's no news. 
um, and nothing, nothing um, unique, but they do apply it on a specific level when they send messages, when they do campaigns, when they do direct uh, to consumer communication, et cetera. But what they often forget is the overarching story or what we call the meta story, the myth um, that everything should ladder up to, you know, or, or everything should flow from either way. And I think that is, that is the important part and that gets even, even more forgotten these days because the opportunities are so many. You have so many more touch points and channels to communicate on and so many more different subdivided audiences where you feel like I have to have a special message for that person or for that group or on this channel. And so you kind of fragment your messaging instead of like leading it all up to that one overarching myth. Ben and Jerry's on the other hand, has not, it doesn't have that problem. I think Ben and Jerry's, albeit, um, really working on two angles, on one on a self-indulgent like super ice cream and on the other on having like a socio-political um, positioning. So you, you're, you're having those two things to juggle. And I would find that interesting, well, perhaps from first from a, from a personal perspective, um, what drew you to that company? What, what keeps you at that company? Dave? Well, you know, my, my background is, is kind of eclectic. Uh, I spent the first 20 years of my career as an environmental activist for organizations like Greenpeace in the last now 20 years, uh, the business side of the fence, um, you know, for me, it's always been about, you know, how can I, uh, uh, you know, create the kind of positive change that I, that I, I wish to have in the world. And, and that's, you know, it's a perfect marriage for me because that's what Ben and Jerry's is all about. You know, in the intro to the uh, conversation, I think, um, you know, it was said, uh, I think Matthew said uh, something about how, uh, we were going to be talking about how to use mission to uh, drive marketing. Uh, that you know, at Ben and Jerry's, it's really just the opposite. Um, you know, we use uh, our business to drive our mission, um, and and you know, of course, we realize that to carry out that mission, we need to have uh, you know, great product, and we need to have 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 all of our uh, financial house in order. So we have this three part mission: the pro the product mission, the economic mission, and the and the social mission that together really drive the business. You know, when, when, when you think about how it got started, Ben and Jerry had an ice cream shop in Burlington, Vermont, and they, you know, started out trying to make great ice cream. Uh, and, but, you know, after a few years when, you know, they, they began to realize what, uh, you know, having a business really was about, all the nuts and bolts, all the headaches, all of the things that uh, are involved with, with creating and making a successful business, they would have walked away if they hadn't have uh, realized that uh, this was an opportunity to advance who they wanted to be in the world, to, to make the kinds of positive change they wanted to have in line with their deeply held values. And, and so uh, really, you know, that has continued. Um, we, uh, uh, we, we have this social mission that we advance, which really continues to advance these core values that are fundamentally based on the values these two real people had. And today we describe it as being around uh, human rights and dignity, uh, social ec economic justice and, and uh, environmental protection and, and uh, re restoration and regeneration. And we, we do that through both the, the, the way we do business. So the, you know, the typical sustainability stuff, a very robust set of values led sourcing programs that are really about creating linked prosperity with all our stakeholders. And then using our influence as a business within society through our our uh, unique model of fan-facing activism and using our our uh, our, our, uh, our platform uh, to say what needs to be said very often. So, Dave, <clears throat> thank you. I mean that 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 makes the story very clear. We, we wanted to talk with you a little bit about the do aspect, which is arguably the most uh, difficult because uh, having a great story, which is our dream, and a great mission is one thing, but making it come to life every day in day out and living up to it is harder, no less so when you have a mission like you do, which is not only twofold as uh, one would assume, but threefold um, and, 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 and high reaching in each, in each area. Can you talk a little bit about like what you, how you make that happen on a day-to-day -day basis on the product level, but then also on the socio-political level, no less so since you were bought by a um, bigger holding company, Unilever, which, um, might make make things different or, or more difficult or even easier in some ways? Well, picking up on the last part of your question, you know, I think Ben & Jerry's is probably still unique in the acquisition agreement that was negotiated with Unilever back in 99, 2000 when, when, when uh, Ben & Jerry's was purchased. Uh, 
you know, we, we uh, through that acquisition agreement, um, really have retained a level of independence that, again, I think is unique. We have a board of directors whose role is to safeguard the social mission and the integrity of, of, of the brand. And, um, you know, they actually have the power uh, under the acquisition agreement to bring the company back independent if uh, they felt that Unilever was not actually uh, living up to that. Now, that obviously hasn't happened. And, and uh, I think we have a very uh, successful uh, relationship as part of, you know, within Unilever, uh, who have themselves really taken on uh, a very uh, uh, genuine approach to uh, uh, sustainability and, and uh, you know, the a bigger, a big vision of, of their social mission. But we, the way we bring it to life every day is, you know, it's a combination of things. I mean, we, we certainly do, as I alluded to, uh, put a lot of uh, effort into this notion of link prosperity and working uh, across our supply chain uh, uh, to, to ensure that uh, everybody's receiving a, a living income, uh, uh, both employees and, and uh, uh, we source uh, you know, ingredients. Um, so there's a range of things we do there, but um, much of what we do and what we're known for uh, is our activism. Uh, and sometimes that takes expression uh, in the case, for example, of uh, we recently are, are launched uh, Colin Kaepernick's uh, uh, Change the World uh, with uh, some of the, 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 uh, the profits going to support his Know Your Rights camp uh, as one example. But we do a lot of work uh, uh, we have NGO partners and most of what we do in our activism is really led by these partners. And, and what we try to do is bring the tools we have as a business to the table to advance their cause and, and take, take our, our, you know, the leadership from, from them. And, and so it can be something like working with a coalition uh, in St. Louis to close this notorious workhouse jail, which uh, has held, you know, majority black, uh, 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 People who who were, who were pre-trial because they and they're just there because they couldn't afford cash bail, uh, and uh, the coalition uh, has successfully got the uh, board of aldermen to uh, pass uh, uh, something last year to, to to close it. Working with Color of Change and and uh, ACLU and Advancement Project to to do a, a range of things, uh, mostly focused now in the U.S. on uh, uh, racial justice on, on racial equity. Uh, so there are specific campaigns that we uh, uh, you know, bring, bring our efforts to, and that may take the form of, of uh, working with them to use our, our uh, platform on social media to really uh, draw people to their efforts. Uh, but also uh, in the case of, uh, you know, moments where uh, something needs to be said by leaders across society, we raise our voices using social media channels. So we, we had this very widely uh, shared uh, statement uh, on uh, dismantling white supremacy in the wake of the George <laughs> Floyd murder. <laughs> More recently, uh, the day after the uh, insurrection of the Capitol, uh, calling out that this was really, uh, you know, a riot by uh, white supremacists, uh, and and uh, so we, you know, we we take that role seriously. The you know, uh, social responsibility, um, corporate citizenship means being a true citizen, and and uh, you know. Um, being being a responsible uh, one that, that uses our mouthpiece uh, where where it can you know where it's needed. Dave, I, I, oh, you go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I, I think those are very strong examples showing that you know to put your money, energy, effort, and risk controversy, uh, frankly, which you do all the time, where your mouth is. A great example about doing. We have one question from somebody who prefers to remain anonymous, uh, which is interesting. I'd like to get your take on it, which is uh, uh, anonymous says, I've seen CPG brands trying to convert to purpose-driven brands and mission-driven brands by doing one or two things. Either they manufacture in a sustainable way or they take on some charitable community-based cause or join uh, such an organization. Which one is stronger? Now, to me, that rings like it's missing one of those fundamentals, which is the DNA of your organization needs to be into it. It's not just saying, what do we do now, sustainability or community action? What's your recommendation for brands, which is actually another question we have here, that already exists, that were not sustainable or higher purpose led? Um, what should they do? And then I know Wolfgang will have a point of view on that as well. 
Well, you know, I think, you know, my own view is uh, uh, that you really got to find a true purpose. Uh, you know, for us, we don't do cause related marketing. We have our values and the things we want to advance and we set about um, our work to try to, uh, you know, make those changes. Um, and, and we know that there is a byproduct of that, which is actually building the brand. But we also understand that the minute we do it for that purpose, uh, it loses its magic. Uh, and so we really keep that function very distinct um, and we don't measure our success in, in ways that um, uh, attempt to capture, uh, you know, that, that kind of brand value building aspect. It's really about whether we're making change or not. Uh, and, and, and so I, I, I'd say find something that, that is truly important. Obviously, most folks think about it in relation to the business and the category that they're in, but we're certainly uh, proof of the fact that it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, and, but, you know, what we do in that process is that we create a very deep relationship uh, with our fans. I mean, the closest, Ben said this, the closest relationship you can have uh, with your consumers is over shared values. And that starts with actually having values, not asking what do our fans value and how do we associate ourselves with that, but just coming out with what it is. And, and, and that preserves the authenticity. And it means we're controversial, um, uh, you know, but we would rather, uh, uh, you know, again, achieve the change we're after. And, and from a business standpoint, it's been very uh, useful to have that really genuinely close relationship over shared values. And, uh, you know, uh, not everybody agrees. And it turns out we don't need everybody to agree with us to be very successful in business. <laughs> Um, one question actually to follow up on that. I mean, you, you said going in that your business is actually the engine for your bigger purpose, a sociopolitical one and mission. And um, <clears throat> that makes perfect sense. Do those two ever cross, not just in the famous naming of your ice cream concoctions, but um, is there also any other kind of like inspiration that comes from a certain cause um, in terms of the product development or any other kind of like interlinkage between um, the, the product that you actually develop and um, do so fabulously and then the um, the activism that you do equally fabulously, but in parallel. Well, it, you know, I should say, uh, you know, very clearly these concoctions have to be euphoric. They have to be fabulous in order for all of this to work. So, uh, you know, and, and they are. Pretend that it's just about going out and making uh, controversial statements. We've got to make the best ice cream uh, there is. And, and I think we do that. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I think this notion of link prosperity uh, is a big part of what drives us. And so a lot of that really does, you know, influence, uh, you know, the product. Um, uh, we, we uh, over the past year, uh, uh, I guess, pretty recently uh, announced that we've committed to paying um, uh, a living income price premium to our cocoa farmers. Uh, and, and uh, you know, where and how we source cocoa is uh, obviously, you uh, uh, goes all the way from our values to how the product tastes and, and how people experience it. The, uh, the brownies that we use in chocolate fudge brownie and a lot of our other products are made by Grayston in uh, Yonkers, New York, which uh, has pioneered the concept of uh, open hiring, really giving job opportunities for people who are very hard to employ and, and uh, you know, a wonderful story there that we've been really happy to support. So that's got a very direct link uh, as does our cookie dough, which is uh, made by a company here in Vermont called Rhino, which is uh, taking that open hiring concept and applying it to uh, refugees and, uh, and, and asylum seekers that are, that are living here in, in Burlington. So, you know, it, it, there is a lot of, uh, of, of inspiration, uh, you know, that comes back and forth from the social mission uh, and our, our product development. And, and uh, you know, when you look at a, at a, at a product like uh, Colin Kaepernick's uh, uh, Change the World, uh, he's a vegan. Um, and, uh, you know, we developed that product, uh, you know, uh, in conjunction with, with, with him and, you know, what, what he likes and, uh, um, uh, you know, there's a whole aspect to the social mission there that, that rides with that as well. Cool. Excellent. Cool. Thank um, you. JP, you're the keeper of time. Do we have to move right. on? Right. So I, I want to, I want to move on <laughs> also because there are interesting questions here directed yeah. at Deborah. Um, so We've heard about the dreaming. We definitely also heard about the doing uh, right now with Ben and Jerry's. The third aspect um, 
um, we, we call the daring, and you already heard that from Dave, they dare uh, in their relationship with people, they dare them not to be complacent, and also they dare them from a taste bud perspective. Wolfgang, can you talk a little bit about that? And then Deborah, I think, has a, is an interesting position because there it is all about community and relationship. Yeah, the, the, the I mean, the, it, it's very easy. The daring part is the one where it's about the interaction, the engagement with the world. And that defines, that starts, of course, first with defining your target or your uber target, as we like to call it, the one that you really design for, the one that you definitely want to have in the boat. Um, because they are your fans, they are the ones that you're your evangelists, you know. And then, of course, how you keep them and ignite them or ignite all of your targets. So <clears throat> it's particularly interesting in the context of Nextdoor, I think, to figure out, because you, as you said, like real people, real neighborhoods, they are diverse. Do you have anything like an Uber target, like an Uber target, like one that really symbolizes your, your dream the best, or is it all of them? Okay, it's everyone, right? So for us, it's really one neighborhood, one neighbor at a time, right? So our beginning story, it's a 10 year old story that sounds more relevant than ever today because it goes back to 10 years ago, Pew Research put out a study and said, 28% of people don't know a single neighbor and a single neighbor. So and the, the point being, the more we're connected, the more we're actually disconnected. And so with all the social media and et cetera out there, people were moving away from each other. And the need, we all know there's a re basic physical need that we all as humans have. You have to be connected to those around you. So I look at the dream and the dare as one in the same for us. Our bigger mission, our bigger purpose is to go cultivate a kinder world where everyone has a neighborhood they can rely on. We're zooming right in on neighborhood. Everybody neighborhood, this past year has spotlighted that more than ever. And the whole point of literally, you need the information, you need the tools to connect. We wanna use online to get people offline and to get them together and connect in real life. So it goes back to the dare for us is to conquer loneliness. The dare for us is to conquer small business falling off a cliff. The, the dare for us is the same as the dream, which if everybody has a community, we all step out of our front door at some point in the day, hopefully maybe with a mask on at this point, but you all step outside, you need that community to be thriving. You need to be plugged into it. So really we think about it every day. How do we help you plug into the neighborhoods that matter to you? It may be right outside your door. It may be where you were, your, fam your family is, your kids are at school, your parents are somewhere else. There are neighborhoods, you need to know what's going on there. And so we've seen this come to light in this past year again, if you think of COVID, the first thing people needed was information. It's no different than when a hurricane, today I'm in the Chicagoland area and this past couple of days it's snow, right? It's like literally there's people who can't get out of their door, they need help and there's a, there's a way to connect to somebody around you. And then having tools, one of the things we did fast as fast as we could, and it all goes back to what we're talking about here of how are you meeting the need for those that you're serving? And so, go back to last summer, it was as fast as possible creating a help map. It's literally just a tool that people can literally connect with each other, help me get to the pharmacy, help me get to the, the grocery store, it just literally giving people the tools to do what they need to. And then it's the neighbors, it's not just the members of the community, it's for example, helping the small businesses. How do I do takeout and gift cards and all the things that would allow me to, to continue, to even continue on? And so I just think all of that, when you say dare for us, we're gonna continue to dare to conquer loneliness. We're gonna dare to really bring people together and have a neighborhood specifically they can rely on because the, the yield of that, the result of that is, is a kinder world. And so whatever we're going through, as long as we have people around us to tap into, we know that will make a difference. I, I love this, this, this whole idea of cultivating a kinder world or equally actually as a, as a big dare to go on, uh, use online to go offline. But um, going back to the first one, cultivating a kind of world, how do you deal with people that are less kind? Um, is there a way to um, exclude people or is it, is it just inclusive at any cost? Or what, how, do you, how do you go, but how do you pol police these things? Okay. Yeah, and if, I, if, if I may just jump in because you help us cover a audience question here. 
So specifically, an audience question was, how do you balance between the nurturing and also protecting the brand? Because the community can go into strange directions, as we know now. We've learned the hard way. Oh, absolutely. And there's nothing easy about this, right? And so we're using everything that we can um, to make our platform a welcoming platform. First and foremost, we think the platform should reflect the neighborhood that we're in. And so to do that, we use product features. There's simple things like a kindness reminder, which the machine learning, we, we're, we're tracking, you know, prompting people when something doesn't look right. We have moderators and this is community based, right? So there's a, a, a volunteers and a team of people that come together to help determine if something should be pulled down or not, if it's appropriate. There's other training of of sort of the moderators within communities of like, let's take this offline into a group conversation. It's not something that's appropriate for broader, but for, for example, there's absolutely no place for racism on the platform. And so when we all went through last summer, there was a lot of work to be done to make sure that everybody's trained to understand that reiterating our community guidelines. So all members, all members know exactly what's expected of them. And then, and then really just making sure that we're monitoring and making it a place that everybody does absolutely feel welcome. So win, wins are things like this. There was a gentleman in Nashville in last summer, a black gentleman, uh, Sean, who posted on next door. He said, I don't feel safe going outside. I don't feel safe, I can go for a walk in my neighborhood. He posted this, the reaction was 150 comments saying you shouldn't feel that way in your own neighborhood and we'll go for a walk with you. So the next day he showed up, 75 people showed up with their mask and went for a walk with him. So it's these sorts of stories that just remind us that the people will do the right thing when they're kind of given the guidance and people will help each other get there and, and really just making sure to enable that and make sure people move forward in a productive way. That's wonderful. It's really, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful story. Um, how are you organized inside, like in terms of your, your organization and, and um, how you run the company? Is it, is it very much also localized and um, democratically uh, spread out or is, is, it, is it more organized and structured and hierarchically? Sure, sure. So we're in 11 countries, right? 270,000 neighborhoods um, around the world. And really from an operations standpoint, we're based in San Francisco. We have spots around the world as we need to. Um, but I think a big, big piece of what makes us successful is our, our community leads, right? So we have people and, and as we put out the ask for people who want to be reviewers or who want to be boosters or who want to play a specific role in the community, it's, it's a volunteer base of hundreds of thousands of people. Right, so we really do, we're able to really um, push through them so it gets closer and closer to the community itself uh, in terms of getting the right information and feedback that we need to help them in moderating and, and making sure everybody again feels welcome on the platform and has the tools that they need to help each other. So it is through and through localized, really down oh, to the, like, yes, which makes, makes total sense. Do you, by the way, I see you're outdoor. Do you go off a lot? Um, since we're all online these days, you know, do you do you really have a lot of opportunity to go out? Oh, in terms of out in my neighborhood? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, out, out of your house and out of out of out of webinars and into the real world again, you know. Okay, we can't wait for more of it, um, <laughs> but <laughs> I think we all have that same sense, and we think this is the year to get back in real life um, and looking forward to that. But more than anything, it's helping people down to your neighborhood, what's open, where can I participate in what's going on? It actually, this gets down to like the information we're providing today is specifically where can I get the vaccine? Specifically, is there 25% in dining or not? Like where can I literally go out and are the schools open today? Are they pushing it back another day in Chicago? Um, those, those are the very um, let me things that are going on. Let, let me take back the virtual microphone here and pretend as if it was a real panel. Um, but it's a, it's a good segue because what you both are talking about is it translates also to the physical world, the outdoor world, et cetera. Because I think I remember, Deborah, you told me about organizing even a next door event and going to it in your neighborhood and discovering and meeting neighbors you never met before, even though you've lived there for ages. Which leads me to one of the uh, participant questions here, which is a very typical one that makes me a bit sad or, uh, yes, which is, 
if you had to use one single channel, and I guess we're talking about media channels here, to tell the world about your mission, which one would it be? And my gut reaction always is, this is not about a channel. This is not about TikTok versus Snapchat versus Facebook versus TV ad. Um, it really always translates to any expression of your brand, right? But I'm biased probably. So I want to throw it out to any of our panelists. If you had to pick a single channel, uh, which channel would you tell your mission through? And if nobody's... Yeah, I have an easy answer. I would use my own channel, right? So next door again, and really, it's because it can impact literally your day, your real life, um, by using online to get offline. But isn't your strongest channel actually word of mouth that might not be within your community at first? I think that it inspires the word of mouth, right? So I think it's become the new age word of mouth. In fact, of people being able to connect very specifically and very directly. Um, and it allows the scalability. I'd be interested, Tom, yeah. what's your thought? Just to build on that, I, you know, from our end, uh, if we had to pick one channel, uh, it would be earned media is, uh, is uh, where we try to tell the story as much as possible. And I think if you have purpose, uh, 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 as, as you know, all the co-panelists here deeply do, the media will want to tell your story. Uh, and that creates a, a very high authenticity uh, uh, opportunity, uh, as well as, um, uh, uh, you know, something that can then really sort of spread from there and sort of take on its own messaging. So you can get a lot of really good feedback on how to hone the message and think it through. So for us, earn media by far is the big one. I call that a sneaky answer with my students, because really you're talking about a lot of different channels that you are actually in, whether it's TV, radio, podcasts, Sure. And so on. <laughs> well, what, I, what I would say, though, is the thing with earned media as a channel, right? It could be, I would say, you know, you could you could say it's a radio show, a TV, you know, and, and so on. But, but it has a level of uh, where you're giving the control to a third party to then tell the story as they see it. You're not right. like a TV commercial. Right. You control the narrative, you know, uh, in every and every bit. And I think what's 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 interesting is the there's in, in today's brands, the more you give control to the audience, the, the, the better it is, honestly. And the more you try to control it yourself, I think the less authentic and the less it will spread. That is if you truly live your mission, not if you're found out on social media and they oh, say, yeah. look what they do. <laughs> but, but interestingly, you're not paying. Is that right? Is that still right? You're not paying for a single ad or communication yet, even though you hit millions of them every month. Is that correct, Tom? That, that's right. I'll go one step further is we run a negative cost marketing department. Uh, so our marketing department actually generates revenue uh, versus spends. Uh, and we do that by really working with our partners uh, to, you know, where they fund us to help amplify their messages around the programs they run with us. Right. So uh, that gets a beautiful, mutual, beneficial uh, uh, approach. And I think this is another sort of important piece is every organization has many partners it works with and every partner has a megaphone. Excellent. And, and you had even a reality show. I don't know if you got We did four seasons in 20 show. countries. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And there, that's a great right. example of negative cost marketing, by the way. You know, in the, uh, the, uh, the TV show, you know, we were getting five-figure checks per episode. And it is in itself uh, a form of, uh, you know, of, 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 of commercial, if you will, or, or, or content. But right. you can generate right. content that generates right. revenue. Okay. I hope that answers the question also by somebody who said, so do you mean PR? I guess almost everything is PR in that sense, uh, but it was very specific. Thank you for that. There is another question here um, that I think it would be interesting for Dave to take a shot at, which is, um, if I understand the question right, is you know, with all this mission and purpose uh, being so central nowadays to brands, aren't platform brands, direct to consumer brands, i.e. many of the startup brands, aren't they advantaged because they can talk directly and they don't need to go through mass retailers? How do you, how do you mm, fulfill your mission and get it across to people when you have to go through supermarkets and mass merchandisers and not only uh, connect directly with your consumer? I think it's true. I, you point of purchase is a very, very uh, limited channel for our communications. Uh, you know, you've got you've got your 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 freezer, and you know whatever's on pack. And uh, but but most of our communication is as it would be with a direct to consumer business through uh, through social media, and and as Tom 
does. We, we have been very successful at leveraging a lot of earned media across channels. Uh, you know, you can on any given night turn on the television and, uh, you know, watch uh, Colbert or somebody eating Ben and Jerry's. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the social media is, is, is what we most exploit and use. And uh, well, obviously a lot of uh, third party sharing right. uh, there and the reach is, you know, uh, incredible. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's being relevant to the conversations that people are in. Right. And we see that, I mean, even if the mission is not, and it does not have to be, in fact, it should not be about social, you know, political or ecological causes if your company cannot really stand for it as an organization. But even with other missions like giving you superhuman powers, i.e. Red Bull, you can see where they, where they spread their mission and their myth outside the supermarket. And in the supermarket, frankly, it looks almost like any other brand, almost. Um, so a lot of that happens outside the retail channel. Uh, Wolfgang, I have a question for you here in the audience that I know you love because we tackle these all the times, which is, um, you know, it's fine to talk about newly created brands or brands that always had a mission, but how do you do this when you're an older brand? How do you approach a refresh and create relevance for a new generation? Um, actually, it's, it's, it's often, well, <clears throat> it's harder from an executional standpoint. It's often easier from a, um, from a story standpoint, because you, you, if you go back to the source, um, and, and I've done that numerous times, it's often forgotten, like, oh, in the course of time, people and organizations forget. And if you go back to the original founding, there usually was a purpose. There was a mission that was beyond just making money. I mean, there are those two, but for most reason, most most um, times, brands started with an idea, with an ideal, with a with a purpose that goes beyond just being profitable, as Tom was saying, going in. And if you find that, if you go back to that and find that and make that come alive in the organization, um, that's that's half the story. That is uh, that's how you have to do it, and that's the only way. The hard part then is to change the organization, transform to really get close to that purpose again. Um, if, if you've lost weight on that. Right, right. There is a question here, which is interesting turn on things. Um, uh, almost has become rhetoric a question, I think, uh, in the context of our discussion, which is, can a marketer brand or company dare to not be an activist or at least have an opinion? Um, mm -hmm. Anyone open to answer? I know what my answer is, but... Um, <laughs> Anyone wants to take a stab at that? Can you can you dare not to have an opinion as a brand? I'm gonna just start in there. I think you, we, we, it depends on the topic, right? Um, and uh, each uh, of us, as you can see here, whether Nextdoor or Ben and Jerry's or TerraCycle, have a domain expertise, uh, an area that I believe if you have a domain expertise or you're gonna declare it as such, as I just did, you have to have an opinion uh, when it touches your domain. But there are so many topics, infinite amount of topics, whether we care about people, planet, you know, uh, uh, animals, and so on and so forth, that there's many things that uh, uh, are outside that domain expertise. And then I don't think you have to have a point of view. Uh, you know, an example is like TerraCycle does not have a point of view on, say, Colin Kaepernick as Ben and Jerry does, and Ben and Jerry should, right? And, uh, uh, but, you know, vice versa, there's many things that we will think about that a brand like Ben & Jerry would not, uh, you know, touch, uh, uh, you know, not because they don't care, but because it may not be the expertise. And I think that is, is, is a key question is where on the spectrum of should, you know, do you declare expertise in that area, uh, uh, you know, should drive whether you then are proactive and have an opinion on that topic. Hey, Deborah, we'll leave the last word to you. When we think about that, having an opinion, how do you manage that as a platform where there are so many opinion and often opposing ones? Do you have a point of view, uh, an opinion? Are you even activist uh, uh, on something or do you need to step back as a, as a platform brand? You know what, it's a simple answer actually. I think it is consistent across of, of being welcoming and inclusive. Right, so we we have to welcome all the opinions and thoughts and ideas, um, be, because that's that's what neighborhoods are. They're a collection of people, and what we love about that, in fact, is the humanness. Right, it's a completely human fact. Um, and and neighborhoods, what they do is they do bring people together with different interests. 
So by virtue of literally those around you, you're going to get connected and hear different points of view. So we actually think of that as promoting civil discourse, which we all should be doing. So um, we can only embrace the differences of those around us and just really just insist on an inclusive, welcoming platform. So all feel well, all feel like they can express themselves. Excellent. And it sounds like, you know, um, I think you said earlier, you know, look at this as uh, forming healthy neighborhoods. That is almost a dare uh, a, a, and an activist uh, step forward uh, in the current environment. So unfortunately, everyone, we're running out of time. We want to be respectful of your time and, and, and exactly at 15, being the good Germans also that at least Wolf and I are. Um, if you, uh, so thanks to all the other panelists as well, huh? even if you're not German, um, just kidding. Um, if you want to more, know more about Uber Brands, Brand Elevation, et cetera, uh, then sign up to my premium brand strategy class, just a little, uh, a little plug here. Uh, if you're too old for that or you don't want to go back to school, then you can always dive into the books we talked about, Brand Elevation and Rethinking Prestige Branding. And if you're cheap and you want to get it all for free, that's possible too at uberbrands.com, tons of case studies, podcasts, and so on. And with that, I want to hand back to Matt, who will tell us about other exciting events that the Global Brand Leadership Center is going to do. Thanks for hosting us again, Matt. Great. Thank and thank you all. Let's give a virtual round of applause to all our panelists, as JP called for. And uh, yes, give you all a chance to say uh, thank you for being here. And uh, it was great. I was nodding left and right while off camera and uh, wishing, uh, wanting to pipe in um, all sorts of my thoughts because there was a lot of great insights here and a lot of great questions from our audience too, of course. Um, so it was a great interaction. <clears throat> really enjoyed things here. Uh, many of you obviously are already on our uh, mailing list, uh, but you can just plug in the Center on Global Brand Leadership. Uh, you'll find our website and you can sign up for our mailing list uh, if you got here through another channel. Uh, hear about our other events. We have one uh, on Monday coming up on HR and its impact on transforming leadership done in partnership with an uh, event platform called Ascend, which is looking at how we uh, drive uh, more inclusivity into leadership over the course of 2021. Um, so really happy to be partnering with them on that. Uh, have a great group of panels from Minovalon and Deloitte uh, and one of our, our former faculty at Columbia University on human capital management. And then for those of you who may be aware or not, uh, last thing I'll, I'll plug here is to save the date April 16th for our Bright Conference uh, on brands, innovation, and technology. Uh, we're forming a great lineup already. We have the Chief Marketing Officer of CBS Health uh, and Visa, along with some of our own uh, faculty and other faculty and uh, executives talking about a range of things involving inclusivity, digital transformation, uh, the future of haptic computer human interfaces, et cetera. So uh, for those who have not uh, been around to a, a, an in-person bright, uh, you can enjoy it virtually on April 16th. Uh, and with that, I will wish everyone a good day and uh, a good time building your brands. Bye, Bye. all. Thank Bye. you. Bye.